Syria, uh, between Israel and Hamas, and invited Hamas uh, to, uh, to uh, Turkey uh, to work with, with the Palestinians in general, to work on Iraqi issues even before the war with Iraq, to try to bring regional states together to try to prevent a war if possible. So this, these are, again, huge uh, changes in, in Turkey as a role. Another uh, intermediary, by the way, well known to you, is uh, Azerbaijan and, uh, and Armenia which uh, is, is, is still underway. Turkey also became an active member of the Islamic Conference Organization, which is the premier sort of Islamic organization representing all Muslim countries in the world. And quite forcefully, a Turk was elected as president of it. Uh, Davut Olu has said that the organization was weak, uh, that it was undemocratic. They were always uh, appointed chiefs of the, or, of the organization. Davut Olu called for this to be open democratic choice and urged that there be more teeth in the policy, more effective policies on the part uh, of this organization. And the Turkey's economy has kept pace with that in trying to expand its economic role as broadly as it could as an instrument of foreign policy. Turkey today unquestionably is the number one economic force, for example, in, in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan, which I think is very, very uh, positive. It, Turkey ceases to look at, at Syria and Iraq and Iran as countries that have Kurds. That was always the only way they thought about those countries was before, as countries that had Kurds, and we need to talk to them about Kurds. Today, Turkey deals with them as full countries, including Kurds, but many, many other issues as well. So I think this is a quite, um, uh, obviously there are many details we can get into. There has been controversy over the Israeli aspect in particular, because one relationship that has somewhat deteriorated uh, in this period has been the relationship between Turkey and Israel. I would argue, my personal opinion is that um, I do not think this is a relationship that is going to end. I think there's not the least intention on the part of Davut Olu or Erdogan to end the relationship with Israel, but it, it, it reserves the right to criticize policies that it feels are not appropriate or unhelpful or dangerous uh, the, uh, policies on the part of Israel towards the Palestinian uh, problem, including the need to talk to Hamas. A, a minority of Israelis, but nonetheless a significant number of Israelis, believe that Turkey, not Turkey, that Israel will have to deal with Hamas. Uh, many in the United States believe that Washington will have to deal with Hamas. So Turkey is in a sense out in front on this issue, uh, maybe Israel is uncomfortable and Washington is uncomfortable, but this is not as if this was some wild position. Uh, the chances are that the other countries are slowly following uh, in, this, in the same path, including, including Israel itself. So I just conclude by saying, um, and we haven't even talked about Iran uh, or nuclear issues, uh, which are very, uh, very, are very important. But in a sense, the summary is Turkey is really, I think, coming of age in a geopolitical sense, uh, dealing with everybody, learning, uh, putting a more mature relationship, ceasing to be a loyal ally of anybody, but a player with strong, active interests in the region that it will defend, and it will defend those interests against the EU or Washington or Russia or China or anybody else, but it is also willing to deal with all of these countries and become a significant player in all of these regions. That now includes very much Russia and China. The world is changing and it's no longer a unilateral, a unipolar world and Turkey is, is, is a key element of that. I would argue from my personal perspective that I think these policies are positive even for American interests, but there would be many, perhaps some in this room even, who would, who would disagree with that position. Okay, uh, so that by way of general background to what, what, the, what are the, the rough outlines of Turkey's new foreign policy um, uh, is. So we turn back to Joost uh, Lagendijk to talk uh, I'm sorry, to, um, to uh, Ian, to talk about uh, Turkey and the West. Graham, thank you very much. Um, you know, the first thing I would say about this is that, it, you know, I first, I 
completely agree with your uh, depiction of the extent of change in Turkish foreign policy, but when you look across that, that menu of places where, where Turkish policy has changed, um, you know, when you talk about Turkey in the West, this is in a way the least trendy bit of this, the least gripping bit of this, because it's the place where Turkish interests and policies in a way have changed the least. Uh, it's not that they haven't changed, but the pace of change, and, and the, it's just not as striking. The question is where it goes, what the trajectory is, and so let me say a little bit about that, about uh, Turkey and the West and the European piece of this, not too much because I know Joost is going to say something and then for the U.S. I mean, the first thing, of course, is that if you look at, um, at these changes, it's not so much that Turkey has abandoned the Western vocation. I mean, I don't buy that. I don't actually like very much at all this vocabulary of uh, losing Turkey, is Turkey lost, who lost Turkey, is Turkey lost, all of that stuff. I think it's, it's rather misleading uh, and it's not very useful. Uh, but having said that, I think there is some net change that's taken place in terms of Turkish policy. Uh, you cannot have all of the activism that you described very well, Graham, in all of these different areas, not just in the Middle East or in Eurasia, but even looking towards Africa and Asia per se, um, Without, uh, without having some diminution of effort behind some of these big projects that were historically so important for Turkey. I actually think that's true. Um, I have had conversations with Turkish leaders uh, where I've asked quite directly, um, okay, you're doing all of these different things and zero problems and, and, and a lot of it is very positive even from the point of view of American interests, but now what are the priorities as you see them in Turkish foreign policy? What's number one, what's number two, what's number three? Um, and of course, I'm waiting to hear, well, it's Europe and it's, uh, well, the answer comes back, no, 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 we don't look at it that way. We don't look at it that way. And, and I'm tempted to say, as a kind of American strategist, that, well, that's, you know, strategy is about priorities. Tell me what the priorities are. You can't just have a kind of all azimuths engagement with the world with no big projects that matter. And then, you know, on reflection, it strikes me that that's kind of a, a strangely kind of ethnocentric way of, of putting the problem in a sense. I mean, not everybody does think about strategy that way. And, and so I just leave that as an open question. I, I do think there is something of a distraction effect at work here. I don't think it's all negative by any means. Um, you know, when I dealt with these things in the government, uh, probably 80% of our time in U.S.-Turkish relations was taken up with crisis management in the Aegean between Greece and Turkey. That's completely gone. It's not that they've resolved the issues, but that kind of very, very difficult conflict-ridden relationship, uh, even within NATO, is largely off the agenda. And that's quite positive. Uh, a couple of other things that I think have changed that bear on this issue of, of, of Turkey in the West. Um, affinities. I mean, clearly, I think, in my perception anyway, the Turkish leadership, uh, the party in power, has a different set of affinities. This matters. Personalities matter. I think this is a, a leadership that is just as comfortable visiting the Gulf or visiting, going to Tehran, going to Damascus, uh, as, as going to Brussels or going to Washington, maybe more so. Uh, and that makes, that makes a difference. Um, some other things, the commercial dimension of this. I think a lot of the activism that you see outside the Western sphere is actually commercially driven. Um, it's not that it doesn't have political and strategic effects ultimately, but it is commercially driven in the Middle East and in, and in Eurasia, uh, which gives it a big constituency in Turkey. Something else, and here I realize I'm straying a little off the Western issue, but I think it's, in, it's interesting. Um, we have a tendency in Washington uh, to debate this in terms of Turkey West or secular versus religious identities and foreign policy, but I hear something else when I listen to the Turkish leadership uh, talk in public fora about foreign policy. The vocabulary now to me sounds very much like uh, the global south vocabulary to an extent, the, the sort of non-aligned vocabulary to an extent. Um, it's a totally different cut through this problem, which I think is quite interesting and has implications for how the West uh, deals with Turkey. And then finally on this about public opinion, I mean, it's been mentioned a number of times, but Turkey is a place today where public opinion counts in foreign policy making. And, and we have a tendency to forget this, and we go back to some of the critical sort of determinative issues in the last years between the United States and Turkey, for example, 2003 and Iraq. Uh, you know, had we kept our eye on Turkish public opinion, perhaps we might not have been quite as surprised at the result uh, in 2003. On Turkey and Europe, um, 
just very briefly, but I know we're going to 